you. Um, I'm Caroline, and I'm in the middle of two book projects, um, one about city-states in southern Italy and one about urban gardening in early medieval cities. And the, these two projects have converged a, around a problem, which is how to interpret the experience of space in early medieval cities. And it's particularly relevant because, as I'm finding, in the city-states of southern Italy in the period from about 600 to about 1100, everything happened in cities. So unlike other parts of Italy and other parts of the medieval world where there was a, a kind of movement and flow between territory and cities, in the city-states of southern Italy, in Naples, in Rome, in, Be in Benevento, in Salerno, in Bari, the theatre of politics took place in cities. And so the, the mechanisms by which we understand investment in urban structures and in urban fabric, I think, become even more complicated and important. So what I'm going to try to do today is lay out for you um, <clears throat> how urbanism relates to this theme of, of space in the case of my current research. And I want to sketch out some patterns that I observe of urban intensification and the contributing factor of popular religion and think also about unbuilt spaces, my, my gardens in particular. And then I want to step away from my time period and my, um, my area of research in particular to, to think uh, about the theoretical frames through which historians and archaeologists interpret the built environment of medieval cities. And I should point out that while I am an archaeologist, for everything I'm discussing today, I'm going to be using textual evidence. And um, I think from the vantage point of the medieval city, it's a little bit different from the Roman world in the sense that there's been a lot of talk about the, the tension and anguish um, created by the divergence of the historical record and the textual record, and uh, the historical record and the archaeological record. And I think we've got um, we, we've we've moved beyond that a bit, and I think we've got some good coping strategies for using the textual record to explore and reconstruct the material world. So everything I'm going to be speaking from today it comes from the historical record. So. <clears throat> As I said, in southern Italy, cities are the principal loci of administration and authority. They're the centers of cult, and that's usually attached to power structures. Assembly politics, public discourse, all of these things are located in cities in southern Italy. These were sometimes quite public spaces, but also private spaces that were attached to urban palaces. How was urban defined for the people living in southern Italy? Well. The documentary record of that is very, very clear. Every property document from southern Italy makes very, very clear whether the property in question is refer, refer, whether the property in question is inside the city walls or outside the city walls. So, here, uh, just to give you an overview of the area that I'm speaking about, mostly this sort of orange bit and this and these yellow bits in the south here. So, <clears throat> walls. I'm showing you here the late Roman walls of, of Rome that are very, very familiar, but they're typical of walls for, that are built in late antiquity and rebuilt over the course of the Middle Ages in southern cities in, in Italy. Now, Brian Ward Perkins, Simon Lozeby, Hendrik Day, among many others, have long recognized the value of city walls and the effect of concentrating multifocal topographies into clearly defined and nucleated spaces in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. These same processes are at play on a regional level when the majority of building efforts were concentrated on that nucleus, resources, labor, donations, and quite simply people's energies and, and mental attentions are concentrated on cities. And so they then become the, the fonds at origo of society and economy as well as politics. If we take the example of Naples in the early Middle Ages, and I'm showing you a sketch map of that here, the city walls are built in the 5th century, then they're rebuilt in the 10th and the 11th century, and the new metro lines that are going on in Naples are making really clear um, the chronology and the shape of the medieval rebuildings of, of, the, of the circuit. So these defined a nucleus of a city, clearly. But the urban sphere that I see in the historical record is not limited just to that which happened within the city walls. So I'm going to give you an example. While the property documents tell us 
inside, outside, mattered to people writing in the period 600 to 1100. We can also read through their texts to see that what happened just outside the walls mattered quite a lot as well. So, the Gesta Episcoporum Neapolitanorum, which is a, a history of the bishops of Naples, recounts that in the 760s, a bishop um, was elected during the, the lifetime of his predecessor. This is not very good for his predecessor. Um, so he, Bishop Paul II, was sent to Rome to be consecrated. He couldn't be consecrated in Naples. And as punishment, the Duke of Naples refused him re-entry into the city for two years, leaving him in exile at San Gennaro. And San Gennaro is about two kilometers out, uh, up on, outside on this hill, outside of the city walls of Naples. Now, exile outside the walls is distinctly inferior, but this is not Napoleon on St. Helena. That bishop, Paul II, maintained a standard of episcopal patronage that was associated with his office. He commissioned um, building renovations, in particular in the church of, Saint Gennaro, of, of, Saint, um, of San Gennaro, where he was exiled. And in this period, the mints of Naples, for which the duke, his enemy, is responsible, had, were in the process of replacing the image of the Byzantine emperor on their coinage with that of the duke and also of San Gennaro. So what the exiled bishop was doing in honor of San Gennaro was deeply tied into the contemporary politics of what was happening inside the city walls as well. He was in the evolving community of the faithful and the city's saints. And this is a point I'll return to in a minute. <clears throat> so city walls provided definition to the city, but they were distinctly permeable. People moved in and out of them all day, every day. And the processes of moving through the walls, for example, to pay rent, repeated that kind of centripetal force that other scholars have recognized that walls themselves created. So to take as an example, rental contracts from one higaman, so one abbot, of a Neapolitan urban monastery of St. Sergius and Bacchus. So this is the, these are the, the rental contracts of one abbot, Pancratius. And so over the years 1016 to 1023, he orchestrated the delivery of a pretty significant quantity of food into the monks of his monastery and to a local dependency inside the city walls of Naples. And I think this gives a pretty good example of how a cloistered urban religious community, which is quite separate from the people living in Naples, actually commanded an enormous amount of attention and resources from the countryside as well as the citizens, the, the, citizens, the people living in the city. So I, I can show you on a map how this works. From farms that are located in the hinterlands of the city, sort of in the immediate suburban area of Naples, over the course of the entire year, rent in kind, so rent in terms of foodstuffs, are being brought, delivered into the monastery's urban cellars. <clears throat> so each renter delivers his rent in kind to the urban landlord. And that, I think, we have to understand how that reinforces through practice, through embodiment, the power structure of the landlord and the renter and of the abbot and his dedicated religious community within the city walls. Now, <clears throat> popular religion also provided a, a centripetal force. In southern Italy over the 8th and 9th centuries, the regional polyfocal landscape of late Roman and Byzantine Italy shifted into dense urban concentrated centers. So here I'm showing you, I won't go into each of these, but I'm showing you the, the, the saints' relics that are translated into Rome over the course, of the, for the period from the 750s up to the 820s. Now you'll see that all those stars outside the city walls represent places where the saint had been venerated according to contemporary hagiography and liturgical calendars. And those are brought into urban churches, usually at the behest of a pope, but sometimes with, with private patronage as well. That phenomenon at Rome is, is, is typical in many ways. Here I'm showing you some very particular stories around the, the saints' translations from the, the middle of the 8th century under Arechis II. In, in, these, in this particular example, there are a series of 12 martyred saints who are 
buried where they were martyred, scattered through the countryside, um, going towards Puglia, uh, around the city of Benevento. And <clears throat> Arecchis II, as ruler, brings their relics from the territory that he's ruling into not only the city of Benevento, but into the Palatine Chapel attached to, to his palace in the city of Benevento. Now, the contemporary narrative that describes this say that he does this um, as a lover of God, but he does it for the populace of Benevento. And he becomes a protector of the bodies and souls of the patria, that is the whole political party, uh, polity um, of the city-state of Benevento. And <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion about whether we can understand these, these actions as being solely something to do with the ruler, or whether they translated out into um, uh, something that brought spiritual rewards or benefits to the people of Benevento. And I think there's pretty good evidence from, contempt from 8th century Benevento that people saw this as something that they were doing for the consensus of the city of Benevento, not exclusively for the self-promotion of the ruler himself. That same practice carries on later on in Benevento, where we get the theft of relics from of, Saint, of San Gennaro, the, the, the bishop of Benevento who was buried at Naples. The, the body moves from Naples to Benevento at a very tricky political moment when Benevento is holding Naples under siege. A woman has a vision that the bishop, San Gennaro, whose, mon whose face is on the coins of Naples, remember, <clears throat> that his body gets um, miraculously, uh, um, uh, well, his body gets stolen and, and taken back to Benevento and is miraculously happy there at Benevento. A later, uh, it gets put into the, the cathedral of Benevento in an oratory that's called Jerusalem. So there's a kind of cosmopolitanism uh, and a universalism in, in the depositing of the bishop's body in, in a place called Jerusalem. But the contemporary literature says that that San Gennaro and um, the, the bodies of Festus and Desiderius, who are others who were martyred with him, are reunited, right? All of these disparate bodies and disparate martyrdom stories and different days on the saintly calendar are being reunited and being put in a new house inside the city walls in Benevento, attached to the ruler. So within about four generations, the sacred landscape of southern Italy is transformed pretty dramatically. The overwhelming majority of saints' cults become urban, and they become tied with the urban liturgy and the self-presentation of rulers and ruling families, and they become topographically rooted in cities. Now, the major rural shrines at Monte Cassino, at Monte Sant'Angelo, at San Vincenzo del Torno are exceptions, which I think prove this rule for, for southern Italy. And I think it's also really important to remember that the local politics at play in these relic translations become clear when you realize that there are no Roman relics translated into Naples or into Benevento or into Salerno at this time. So this is the moment when, under the Carolingians, everyone's really excited about Roman relics, but the Southern Italians are not. The Southern Italians are seeing regional politics as being much more important and the consolidation of their regional territories through r relics and cults is much more interesting to them. Now, <clears throat> I've spent a certain amount of time speaking about <clears throat> forces at play in, in, in the urban context. And within the Southern Italian context, we've spent, well, there's been a lot of scholarly energy dedicated to the, to the issue of the unbuilt environment and how dereliction of the ancient city relates to larger narratives of continuity or rupture with the ancient past and how we can interpret evidence for uh, dereliction, uh, for, for um, rubbish tips, or for the abandonment of cities or the um, deviation from ancient city, urban plans. But the archaeological evidence, some of the archaeological evidence for dereliction, and I'm speaking specifically about dark earth in Italy here, is best understood in the context of the textual evidence for an entirely different phenomenon, and that is urban cultivation of food and urban gardening. And for this, we have significant textual evidence in the form of property contracts, which point to the abundance of cultivated spaces next to houses and in designated garden neighborhoods. 
And the values that were placed on these properties and the strategies that people used to keep them, to keep them either in the family or to donate strategically parcels of land which provided food growing opportunities. So I'm just going to show you one example here and I've excerpted from the, um, from the property document for you which gives, is we're in Naples in, in 920, a mother and daughter leave uh, two parcels, productive parcels, urban gardens and cistern to their local church, but they maintain use of it for the duration of their lifetimes. Now, I came, I, to, to pardon the pun, I came up against a brick wall here. Um, we have methods of understanding medieval investment in city fabric. We have methods of understanding how architecture made sense to people in the medieval city. How walls or how churches or how uh, altars or how new houses might have worked. But we don't really have good theoretical understanding of how the unbuilt or the, the, the potentially um, cultivatable land might have worked except as dereliction. And this is clearly not derelict land. These gardens are urban or productive urban spaces that were valued and that were safeguarded by this particular strategy of donation. So <clears throat> I want now to reassess how I understand the relationship between space and ideas of, of community. So, so for my part, and I suspect it's going to be true for, for most of you here, or for many of you here, that the, the, the kind of key theoretical models that underpin the significance of building new things in an urban environment are Henri Lefebvre's idea of the social construction of space, 1974, and Pierre Bourdieu's theory of practice, 1972. So both of these very familiar texts share Marx's principles about social reproduction and the way in which materiality was a tool that was used both explicitly and implicitly by the hegemony for the reproduction of social values. Um, and both of the books in which these theories were laid out uh, were written before I was born. Now, that in itself is not a particular problem, but surely this should occasion some stock taking. So. I think for medievalists, structuralist ideas and post-structuralist ideas and, and, and critiques, critiques of them and ideas about representation through the material world remain the key interpretative frameworks for reading competition and expressions of power in the built environment. So we conventionally use the patronage of, building, of, of monumental buildings, which is usually churches for our period which often have images of patrons and inscriptions of their names. We use these as key indicators of social ambition and a representation of wealth and power in the medieval city. So when a person builds a church, he's representing his command of resources in order to marshal materials and labor to intervene in, in an urban landscape. I, we, we don't very often articulate a the theoretical framework for this, um, this what, what Martin Carver called arguments in stone. We, myself included, um, use and draw upon historicist uh, evidence. So we use historical examples of civic evergetism in the Roman world, of public munificence as a tool for demonstrating wealth, disposable resources, as well as Roman values and senatorial allegiances. When we try to, 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 to theorize that Roman process, it finds some support, I think, in, in Henri de Fev's ideas about the social production of space and about how patronage participated in the representation of authority in the realm of an urban space and the intervention in, in daily life provided by it. See the reference to Michel de Certeau there. So <clears throat> from the ways in which the documents identify boundaries of properties like this one, um, although the, I'm afraid that the excerpt that I'm giving you here is, doesn't include all of the details about the boundaries, but the boundaries of these properties are identified by the people who owned them. So there's a way in which the document attests to a, a highly communicated urban landscape, right, where people knew what was, um, who owned which side of, which, of of their property, and this was this was. Um, this, there was a lot of communication about who owned parts of these cities. And so the patronage of these, these, these particular kinds of, of land, I think, mattered quite a bit. Now, if I can just broadly generalize, generalize archaeology has taken the exploration of the built environment and materiality towards, well, 
towards phenomenology, towards embodied interaction with the material world located in the individual. And sociologists and historians of the modern period have gone in a really different direction, looking at agency of things, collective agency within the network and actor network theory. And that line of thinking has, I think, um, stress that the material world is not simply a product of society, but it's an agent that, which has taken on independent qualities and interacts in diverse ways over time with different kinds of people. So <clears throat> scholarship on the agency of things in a capitalist, so modern society, has been, I think, really stimulating for modern historians, interested in the relationships between law and order in the material world over the past 20 years. So scholars of the modern period have used the, the Latourian theoretical tools to identify ways in which the built environment, including infrastructural and generally hidden things like plumbing, can work in the guise of modernism to push people to practice governmentality on themselves, for example. And things, as products and as mediators, as well as commodities, might be helpful for us in thinking about the structures of the built environment and the practice of daily life or how that's recorded in our evidence. And I find this to be true in terms of foodstuffs, the payment of rent in kind or in cash, the monastic landlord cannot be understand, this, we can't understand this as modernism. This is not the practice of governmentality. This is straightforwardly a hegemonic self-reproduction of social order and rule, the domination of the landowning institution over the working peasants, and the extraction of resources in labor and product. Nonetheless, the repetition over the course of the calendar and the practice of moving rent in, in, in kind to repositories within, within the city context, I think helps us to understand the way an institution stands in for the people who are living inside it, but also to the wider landscape. Our ladies in Naples who gave their gardens found a way to build a relationship with the institution who, to whom they donated because the monks took a vested interest in the property that they had been given until it actually became theirs. So in conclusion, the cities of southern Italy enjoyed intensification of urbanism over the course of the 8th to 11th centuries. Through the material forms of cities and through the manipulation of cult, of cult interest, as well as things like rental payments, rulers and the elite of southern Italy developed urban space that was collective, that insisted and fostered on social cohesion, and that clearly delineated for when it was important to do so, that which was inside and urban and that was extra urban and, and separate. If structuralist and post-structuralist theories depend overly much on representation and symbolic value, and Latourian theories depend perhaps too much on commodification and practice of statehood, they both, if taken obliquely, can be used to sharpen the questions we ask of our or my medieval evidence, to reveal the practice of space and, I'm going to use the quote from Andrew Pickering, dance of agency that the material built environment provided us. Thank you.